AlienCon main stage. Please welcome star of the hit A&E series, Ghost Hunters, Grant Wilson. Yeah. Whoa, hello! How are you guys doing? Oh my gosh. I expected maybe four people, but this is probably more than four people. How are you guys doing today? Enjoying AlienCon? Well, we're not quite alien related, but we are weird and we embrace that. So thank you weirdos for being here. Thank you. I tell you what, I was on Ghost Hunters for eight seasons. Um, loved it, enjoyed it. Left because I have a lovely wife and three boys and they were just becoming teenagers. So I felt, you know, my poor wife needs a little support there. Um, and then the time was right. I felt like I needed to get back out there. And I got a team, and we're kicking butt, and hopefully you guys like what you've seen so far, and we're just getting started. So thank you for your support. All right, well, without further ado, let me uh, introduce the team. This is the first time they've done an event, so note that. <laughs> so I'd like to introduce, of course, Daryl Marston. Daryl? Daryl? And, oh, wow. That beard, though. We've got uh, Kristen Lumen otherwise known as Red. There she is. We got Brian Murray. The man, the myth, the legend. We got Rochelle Stratton, everybody. Lovely, wonderful. We got Mustafa Catalari. Come on, Mustafa. The human cartoon. And we have Brandon Alvis, our resident alien himself. There he is. <laughs> oh, we get to sit. That's nice. Woo. So uh, let's talk aliens, right? That's why we're here. No, <laughs> Guys, I guess, you know, you're, you're pretty much new faces to a lot of people, but they got to know us a little bit. Um, but the big question remains, what got you started? What got you to be a paranormal investigator? Daryl, let's start with you. Yeah, I think uh, when I started in the mid 2000s, um, a lot of it was just you know doing local places, you know, trying to get my you know get it under under me, you know, try to learn the field. Um, when my father passed away in 2006 is when I really got serious about it, and it's just grown over the years. The passing of my son in 2016 really turned me around, and to actually take this field very serious and uh, take it in a different direction than most people do. Jeez, yeah. Thank you. Kristen. Um, is it, oh, good. It is working. I wasn't sure for a sec. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't have a red light on. You have to try it first, Kristen. That's there how these things work. Testing, testing. Um, I've always been fascinated with it. When I was a little girl, I had the ghost club, um, but that was basically just a bunch of 11-year-olds running around in a playground thinking every uh, swing set was haunted. So um, hopefully I've upgraded since then. Uh, then I got into school for psychology, and they offered paranormal psychology courses. And I just thought, oh my gosh, my life has made my two passions are, uh, they can be put together. And I didn't know that existed. And so I took as many paranormal psychology courses that I could take and learned about how the mind can manifest a paranormal experience and also how it reacts to a paranormal experience, which was so fascinating to me. And then I went on to become a certified hypnotherapist and also use what I know about the brain during any investigation, even with the other investigators, and especially working with the clients, understanding their fear and how to help ease their minds so they can uh, still live in their home comfortably. It's come super in handy. Like, we've helped so many people. It's funny, you look and you see Kristen over there and she's just like giving this person a therapy session. And it helps, it helps. Or even the, the, the ghost sometimes. Yeah, right. I feel like I'm doing that as well. Interdimensional therapist. Yeah. There you go. What about you, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> Just it's a funny story. So I was 16 years old, and I went over to this girl's house to... To what, Brian? To, to, <laughs> to try to... Like a lady? Try to get her to go on a date with me. She went to the restroom. Her mother came down and went to put down a tray of drinks, and she did that, and behind her was a man standing there. I saw this man, he looked at me, and then he went away, I left. It was the man a ghost? He was a ghost. Okay, just to make sure. He, I could, I could see. <laughs> Maybe it was. 
no, I could see through him. He went away. I immediately left. Um, I did. I didn't want nothing to do with that girl. To this day, I still have not talked to her. I can't even remember her name. Uh, are you in the crowd? Did you ghost her, Brian? I ghosted her. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Have a good night. I liked it, Kristen. What about you, Rochelle? What got you into this? I like ghosts. That's it. That's a good reason. No, um, I had an experience when I was eight. I went to bed, I woke up in the middle of the night and seen someone standing at the foot of my bed. I told my mom and my sister about it. They thought I was nuts until it happened to my sister the next night. And then I was into it the, from then on out. Well, we know you're nuts, but not in that way, so. Ag agreed. What about you, Gustavo? Oh yeah, um, classic ghost horror movie story. Uh, moved into a new house. My brother and I are in our bedroom and uh, we're like sleeping and we hear all these noises coming downstairs from the kitchen. So we go down and then we see the cabinets opening and closing by themselves and we're like, <laughs> this is awesome. And then <laughs> my mom comes downstairs and then she's like, she sees it too. She's like, boys, go to bed. And um, we went to sleep. And uh, then after that, we just had all this type of like weird phenomenon in the house. And um, I come from a really superstitious like family background. And they're like, oh, every time they had a problem, like my dad's like, it's the ghosts. And I was like, I'm like, he's like, we don't have any money, it's the ghosts. I was like, no, you just haven't worked in two years. <laughs> you know, my mom's like, oh my God, our relationship sucks, it's the ghosts. I was like, no, you just had an arranged marriage. <laughs> like, you know, so so I, noticed a, I noticed a lot of this in my family. So what I would do is um, anytime they had problems, I would go and investigate their homes. And nine times out of 10, it wasn't paranormal. But there's always that one time where I was like, this is kind of, I can't explain this. And, um, and that's what got me really interested. You know, I, I kind of set out to debunk and then now I'm a, now I'm a believer. Yeah. And Brandon, do you have ghosts on your planet? Yeah, sometimes, you know, but in, in 1995, I lost my oldest brother to cancer. And in 2004, I lost another brother to suicide. So that kind of sent me on my journey into the paranormal. Um, but it wasn't until I started actively you know, field investigating that I started to reach out to professionals from various technical industries, medical doctors, scientists, engineers, and trying to help me remain grounded in my research and trying to you know, go out there and prove or disprove hauntings. So um, something I've been doing for about 14 years now. Uh, I call myself a ghost geek because I'm so obsessed with hauntings and uh, the research behind it that I, you know, I'm a geek, so what can I say? You are a poster child for geek. We love you. Um, I started when I was 15. I mean, I was actually more interested in aliens and crypto and uh, conspiracy theories. That was my jam. And I've had many strange experiences with UFOs, aliens, and all sorts of stuff. But um, wasn't really interested, you know, ghosts was just campfire stories and stuff like that. And, and when I was 15, I had something very strange happen. I was outside playing with two of my friends in the woods and I started seeing something that they couldn't see. Now, uh, this became a daily occurrence of seeing this thing and I thought, hey, I'm 15 and I'm already snapped. It was a good run, I'm crazy, lock me up, you know? <laughs> but uh, but uh, thankfully one day, uh, what I was seeing started to mimic one of my friends and so I had my friend stand behind me and I was able to tell him what he was doing for about half an hour, and that made me realize that this was really happening. I was experiencing this. I didn't look for it, it found me. And years and years and years of, of experiencing this thing and other things like it, I mean, it just leaves you scratching your head, and you have to find an answer. <clears throat> and in looking for that answer, I talked to a bunch of people and found that everybody has had an experience, or they know someone who's had a paranormal experience, and everyone's uncomfortable talking about it. So I figured, you know what, if I'm gonna get answers to my own questions, I have to put myself in paranormal situations. So I would exchange comfort for exposure to the paranormal, and that's how I started getting into people's homes. And uh, Not breaking and entering? What's that? I said not breaking and entering? No, never trespass, no, come on. There are kids in the audience. <laughs> are there kids in the audience? I can't see. I, I'll make sure my filter's on. But it was funny because the very first case I did that was in a home of a stranger, I was 16, don't tell my mom. But uh, I went to a stranger's home when I was 16 to investigate the paranormal. And 
it was interesting. I was there and I'm sitting there talking to the homeowner and all of a sudden this apple rounds the corner, comes around the hallway, <laughs> around wicked curveball, I don't know, and hits the homeowner in the head. And I was like, wow, awesome. And the homeowner's like, no, not awesome. Definitely not awesome. <laughs> yeah, so he was like, well, if it can throw an apple, why can't it throw a knife? Good question. So I proceeded to answer that, but I was interrupted by the fact that I heard something out in the hallway. So I thought, okay, somebody's in here playing a trick on us. I went out in the hallway and there was this Ma solid black mass at the end of the hallway and it started to run towards me and I could hear the footsteps, you know. Oh. They were worse than that. But I could hear the footsteps coming and it smacked me in the face and spun me around and I fell down. Mm -hmm. And I stood up from that going, oh yeah. Yeah, this is what I want to do. <laughs> no, and, and yeah, right? I, I, may, I may have been psycho, but it, I knew at that moment, I was just, my heart was with the homeowner. Like, I wasn't afraid of it, he was. And that's when I knew this is what I had to do. So that's what got me into it. Cool, right? Okay, so, um, so there you go. So a, lot, a question we get asked a lot is, you know, okay, are, but are ghosts real? Do you believe in ghosts? And to me, honestly, the answer is, complicated to that. The question is, you know, then is becomes what is a ghost? And uh, that's kind of the crux of what we do. Our show is called Ghost Hunters, but as we've said many times before, we don't actually hunt ghosts. We're paranormal investigators who want to help people feel comfortable in their home. Um, and uh, the more you do this, the more you realize that, uh, that the stranger and stranger things can explain why people might think they're having a ghost. There are mental conditions, schizophrenia, there are temporal anomalies, um, boy, we got stories. I don't know if, uh, if you, uh, I'll ask you questions, but we'll pepper the stories in as we go. Um, one of the things that's important is, um, is that I, this is team was assembled for some very specific reasons. Number one, we're in the business of basically making feel com people feel comfortable in their own homes. So all these people, first and foremost, are very nice people. Um, they all have experience in the paranormal and they're all grounded and they're all had enough free time to actually do a TV show, so that's good. Um, but they have each have real world skills. Like Daryl, you and uh, you and Brian have a construction background. You're a contractor and all that. Yeah. You know, what do you think, both of you, what do you think that brings to an investigation? Well, I think being a contractor and, and knowing inside and outside of a home, being a uh, GC, uh, I know what a house with the kind of noises it makes, uh, you know, HVAC, electrical, plumbing, and things of that nature. So it's easy to dismiss some things, you know, when you're, you're hearing knocking on a wall or on a ceiling or in the floor. It's, you, it, you're more in depth to actually jump in and figure out what it is really quick instead of wasting hours and hours and hours on it. Totally. I mean, you guys go in there and you trim the fat pretty quick. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know exactly what a house sounds like, what the plumbing sounds like. And a lot of times you'll go into people's homes that have these knockings and it could be a just a simple plumbing issue, things like that. So it does definitely help that we have that background for sure. Now, uh, Mustafa, you're a viral media journalist. You're our researcher. You rapidly attack any question we ask you. Yes. I'm like, what's the best burger place around here? You come back with what? rating system of best burgers in town. Um, Life short, eat good burgers. <laughs> you are a history nerd. Um, a lot of people think that job's tedious. Um, a lot of people aren't interested in that. A lot of people don't know what they're talking about because history is excellent and I love researching. <laughs> <laughs> so why, I mean, we see you on the show get so excited. You become this little kid. Um, what is it about what you do, your role, that makes you so excited. Look at him, he's ready to explode yeah. right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to, to, to have the opportunity, okay, I'm gonna point to this, this is kind of be like, I wanna crack a joke, but I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> we went to this one, we had that one case, um, uh, you know, Susan, the one client's yes. home, all right? So her son uh, was very, very, very scared, and um, he was really concerned, and she was kind of handling the paranormal activity rather well, but he was concerned, and. After we had finished our investigation and we closed it out and everything, um, he basically called us his heroes. So like when you're a kid and you're like eight years old and you're lying in bed at night and you're looking up at the ceiling and wondering what you're gonna be, 
like you're not thinking about like oh I can't wait to sit at like a desk job all day and just play like you know Farmville until I run the clock out like you you dream you dream of being somebody's hero and um, in any capacity that you can do that in, if I can do it in this capacity, if me getting on my laptop every day and I can do that by providing people the answers, I'm satisfying eight-year-old Mustafa's fantasy. So I did not betray my childhood self and that's what I get excited for. It's like, oh wow, like I think you're cool. And if I'm ever the kind of person who eight-year-old me would want to kick in the nuts, like I don't want to be that person. So that's why I get excited. <laughs> I want to be proud of myself. Yeah. I think you're cool, Mustafa. Thanks, Grant. <laughs> <laughs> so Brandon, you're the big tech head. Um, that takes a lot of pressure off of my, all of our shoulders, so thank you for that. But um, you know, uh, what what do you hope to achieve technologically wise in a field of paranormal investigation? That's tough, you know. I mean, with the advancement of technology being so rapid, um, it's ever evolving every day. You know, we're always constantly, you know, adapting pieces of technology from other industries for paranormal investigation. Um, but you know, as this technology is advancing, hopefully one day we'll have one device that can really aid us in research. But right now, the data logger that we're using on the show is recording all environmental conditions to an SD card, everything from temperature to pressure to humidity, EMF, and vibration. And it's taking those environmental conditions and the phenomena associated with it and trying to understand the mechanics behind it, that's what really is important to me, is to try and get out of the shadow of pseudoscience and try and step into a factual science when it comes to paranormal investigation, but we're chipping away, you know, little by little, and I think we've been doing some really great work as of now, and um, hopefully, you know, as technology advances, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah, it's something that's cool that happened is, uh, because of our concerted effort, um, I mean, these guys, what you see on the show, guys, you have to understand, that's 43 minutes of television. We film for a week straight, and then there are weeks that go in before and after to make the show what you see. But these guys eat, sleep, and breathe this stuff. I mean, in their downtime, they're out visiting battlefields. They're uh, looking for antiques, trigger objects, and stuff. They just don't rest. Um, you know, and it's cool because that type of dedication starts to produce really good results. And with some things you won't see on the show, until we've actually thoroughly figured it out, is we're, we are making advancements. Uh, we're collecting a lot of data and we're starting to see some unique trends that I haven't seen anyone discuss yet. And that's not to pat ourselves on the back, that's meaning that it's not just entertainment, there's advancement happening here. So um, we will obviously share that with everyone, that's the only way you should do it. Um, very cool stuff, Brandon. Um, now, Rochelle. You and Brian are our adventure team. I've dubbed you the adventure team because there's no place you won't go. There's no hole you won't climb in. I mean, we sent you guys in a mine. You came back with dirty hands and clothes and you were ready to investigate. It was crazy. We get the job done. Okay. <laughs> and I think because other than the mine, the holes keep getting smaller. I think that you're just trying to see if I can actually fit. I don't think there's actually claims in there anymore. You're just like, just see if she'll do it. <laughs> Butter up the sizes yes. and are in. I also think that uh, they've got me with Rochelle because I'm kind of clumsy and they need somebody to watch over me. <laughs> Guys, just wait till you see some of the stuff. Like... You don't want to spoil it, but he destroyed a whole set of stairs. Uh, that's good stuff. Anyway. Yeah. Historic stairs. 200 years old they were. I laughed for like a good 20 minutes. I couldn't get it together. It was the noises that came out of him as he was doing it was hilarious. It was hilarious. It was literally a cartoon, no joke, seriously. Best thing is Brian goes through this entire stair he goes through the entire staircase and he's laying on the ground and Rochelle goes, Did you break anything? And Brian goes, just the entire staircase. <laughs> so uh, what where do you think this desire to crawl in dark, dirty holes and it's a bad way to say it, but what do you think this <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question. You guys are like fearless. Where does it come from? Yeah. Well, I think with me, I'm a mom. So if we have any moms out there, which I'm sure we do, like sometimes you don't want to do something because you're slightly scared, but the job still has to get done. And, you know, my kids scare me every single day. <laughs> Just diving from one. My four-year-old has no fear. He trusts that I'm going to catch him no matter how high up he is and just... Like, spread eagle. 
Spread Eagle Rhymes takes off. It's like half the time I'm not even ready. I don't know how I caught you by your underwear, like, but you didn't hit the floor, so that's good. So I think that like you just get put in situations and I wanna know answers so I can fight through it because I'm a mom and sometimes you just have to do it. Good answer. And I'm also a Marine, man. We're the first ones in. Yeah, there it is, Marine. <laughs> So a dirty one in the dark holes, though. I'll just let you know. She, I'm a little bit bigger. I can't get in some of the holes that she goes into. However, that's something that I like to do, man. I like to get into these areas that some of these guys won't go to. The dirtier, the smellier, the stinker. That's what I want, man. What is wrong with you? I started that conversation with I'm a marine. So what is right with you now? I know. Okay. So guys, it's been a it's been a long, crazy run so far. They are just getting caught up to all the stuff we've been getting into. And, uh, you know, I, I want to know what has been your favorite moment, paranormal or funny or whatever, or emotional, whatever. What has been your favorite moment so far? Chew on that one. You know what? Want me to start so you guys can think about it? <laughs> and I'll take yeah. it. I know mine. There you go. And it's the same one that it's been, and the show is aired, so I can talk about it, okay. right? Um, was the experience at the Pillars home with Tony when uh, we were reaching out to what we believed was a, another entity in the home and we ended up receiving his mother. And that was a really emotional moment for him as well as us because it was something that we weren't expecting. And then there was also the possibility of the entity that we were also trying to reach out to was, was there as well and kind of these two women um, helping us to get this message to, to Tony that he's still being cared for and watched and loved. And those are the moments where your, your heart just melts and you feel really good. The biggest reward you can get in doing this is, is being able to connect someone with perhaps someone who has passed away and, and let them know that they're still uh, watching over them and loving them and um, that was just a really really special moment and I think it was a real special moment for all of us. Oh yeah Kristen you and I were just like all tears. You're bait. We're, we're, Kristen and I are just like oh! and Daryl's over there patting him on the back he's like you okay man? You okay? <laughs> Not a tear in sight all beard all muscle. It's so funny. <laughs> Like, am I supposed to but cry? it's good though. Uh, more, often than, to cry? <laughs> more often than not, guys, we find that the paranormal, as much as we want it to be spooky and scary, it ends up being something as beautiful as demonstrated there. What do you got one, Brandon? Yeah, no, it was uh, Madison Seminary. Um, Mustafa and I were down in the Civil War building in the basement, and I was doing an interview, kind of wrapping up our investigation, which had been rather quiet for the most part. And you know, I was looking at our producer, talking to him when a rock is thrown from the dark room behind him and goes right past me. But what's cool about it is there was a lot more to that than was shown on the show. Um, there was like this gust of cold wind that came out of that dark room and hit the producer and myself. It was one of the first times I've ever experienced what they say is the sensation of uh, you know, an entity going through you. And it, to the point where even like the, my back muscles started tensing up, I started getting sick to my stomach, but I instantly grab, grabbed the data logger from Mustafa and we started to record these environmental conditions associated with it. And there was a change uh, based off of the baseline that we conducted. But what was cool is we also had motion detectors in the room behind our sound person. And she, who is one of the most calm, cool people uh, I've ever worked with, was like, guys, guys, the motion detector in that room's off. Yeah, it's the best is she's from Massachusetts, and then it's like, the Massachusetts came out, and she was all excited. She's like, see that room over there, see that room over there, oh my god, oh my god. She's freaking moving over there, it's wicked freaking moving, like a quad. Awesome. Wicked. Turned into Mark Wahlberg for a second, I was like, what? <laughs> So it was a great moment because like there was so much going on. It was a bit chaotic, but we remained grounded and we started to collect data associated with that event. But you also had people there that are not paranormal investigators that are there to document our investigations and our experience. And they were part of it at that point. And it was, it was really, really interesting. Yeah, and they're hard to rattle. Like you don't really see them like, you know, get flustered by that stuff. And what I will say is like, it was kind of like a beautiful paranormal ballet. Cause when Brandon got hit, he was like, Shh. 
motion, and I see it in my head, like slow motion, he's like, data logger. And then I'm just like, yeah, and I put it, and then we were getting no blips. It started going off, he's like, oh, I knew it. I'm like, dude. <laughs> that we're following with. I'll never forget it, it was awesome. Um, I think Daryl and I could talk about this last one that we did, but like, I, we're not, I can't tell you where it was, um, but for two nights, we did the most runs we've ever done. We did 17 total runs, and we were both experiencing a lot of the similar kind of activity, a lot of the similar claims, and we were having a really hard time trying to communicate with any of the entities there, until finally we started piecing together stuff that had happened. And it seemed like at one point, like on our last few runs, I was like, I turned to Brandon, and I'm like, dude, I feel like, I feel like whatever's here is trying to prank us. And um, I started asking him, like, hey, could you prank us? Sure enough, we started getting like this weird knock that scared us like minutes later. And then we get locked in a room. And then when I'm up with Daryl, you can tell the rest. Yeah, I mean, it, this was just three days ago, guys. I mean, we just left this case. Uh, I came here. Uh, it was, we were starting to ask some questions, like, are you the pranks? You locked my friends into the, the actual room. Uh, we were getting straight hits on the dad recorder with control questions. Uh, actually saying, basically, it was the prankster. And, and he likes to prank paranormal investigators. Right, and we like yeah. verify that multiple times. We're like, whoa. Yeah, then we started walking back. Nothing was, else was happening. Got a little, you know, a little flat there for a while. And we asked, hey, when we go back, you want to play a prank on us, go ahead. So we kind of forgot about it. And we're walking down this long hallway, and all of a sudden this large, probably three or four inch long rock comes flying across the room and almost hit our cameraman. Scared the hell out of him. He, he, he ran in the room and jumped up. <laughs> Me and him were acting like two giddy children running around laughing. <laughs> yeah. I still got the rock. It's in my bag. I can't wait to get home and actually mount on the wall. But it's, it's amazing. Uh, it's an amazing experience. We're still giddy about it. We yeah, were just yeah. about it. <laughs> Thank you. It takes a lot for Daryl to get giddy. Yeah. That was a big moment. Nerds. The thing that's nuts about that is. Brian and I were down in the location they got locked in, yeah. and Brian told, we were with the camera guy that ended up being with them Same when one. the rock got thrown, but he was with us at the time, and we had told him, not we, Brian told them to throw a rock at us, and I was like, I don't think that's a smart idea, because like, it to me so could much. hit you in the head, I don't know, and then later we find out that the camera guy that was with us, it was only us three in the, the location, they threw a rock. He was the guy that was there with the rock. I was like, sorry there. Brian asked that, but that's what happens. Absolutely. Madison Seminary. So I always think that I'm kind of like a tough guy, and if these guys got into us, you know, in a situation, I would be that guy that would go get them and make sure they're okay. I'd put myself out like that, because I care about them. Well, there was an instance where Rochelle, she's my best friend, so this is, listen. <laughs> she started having some of these things that got very emotional for her. She was actually feeling like, uh, you know, she was getting some pains, and I. Go, the same thing that was happening to Brandon at the same time. At the same, yeah. When he was downstairs, so the validation. I couldn't, I don't like seeing that. I couldn't take that, so. Hello? <laughs> All right. Anyways, I couldn't take it, so I asked, you know, the entity or if somebody's harming her, do it to me. From that point on, it got more emotional than I've ever been on any investigation. I couldn't be, I was out of my element, man. I was, I was starting to get a little angry um, seeing that. And when I was doing that, it affected my investigation to the point where I knew I had to get out of there because nothing good was going to come from this. But the part I like about it the most is that every single one of these guys here took care of me after that. And Grant took me out, every one of them. And for the first time, instead of being the guy that I thought was the big tough guy, I, I wasn't at that moment. These guys all picked me up and made me feel, you know, like I was part of the team again. I thank each and every one of you for that. You're the right thing, man. I don't even like watching that part of the thing because it still gets me. You know, I'm sorry. Like in the Marine Corps, I had a team and I wanted to make sure those guys were good. And at that moment, even I even said, I called these guys my squad. I did. You did. You did. Because I felt like they were also uh, just as brother and sisterly as my Marine Corps unit. So again, oh. thanks. Thank you, Brian. For thanks, Brian.
So my favorite moment hasn't been aired yet, but we thought we'd give you a special treat and give you a sneak peek into this week's episode. Yeah, right. So you can look past Mustafa's big head at this. What a tease, what a tease. This was in, this is in Indianapolis. It's uh, it was a German cultural center back in the day, and they still use it to uh, to show you know have concerts and show movies and things like that. And uh, we had been investigating. Daryl, Chris, and I had been investigating, really trying to reach out to the entities, and we just weren't getting anything. And in my mind, we even played music from the time period, German music from the time period, recorded in the time period not getting anything. We used German translation software, nothing. And then day two, as always, kind of wake up with that epiphany. I've got messy hair in my iPhone, like, I got it. <laughs> that, you know, that, great Scott. Scott, Eureka. Um, I felt like this place was a cultural center, so we needed, if we were gonna get any intelligent entities to come out, they needed a real performance. And so it's, if I was walking through that place and I heard, classical music, I'd poke my head in. If I saw it was coming from an iPhone, I'd leave. But if I poked my head in and there was a string quartet, now I'd stay. And I've been a musician most of my life, ever since I was 14, you're a musician too. And music to me is like concentrated liquid emotion. And I couldn't think of any better way to reach out to these entities. And I'll tell you what, those guys got on stage the only light in the room was that ghost light on the end of the stage, and we had all the equipment out, we were all ready, and they started playing, and you could feel it. All of us had chills and goosebumps, I mean, tears in your eyes, it was emotional. And then, spoilers, it worked. <clears throat> It worked, and we felt for a moment there that we were there on the same page, the same level with the entities, enjoying that performance. And I gotta be honest, guys, it was one of the highlights of my career, one of the most emotional moments as a paranormal investigator. Yeah, and I was just hoping to get a free concert out of it, and then like, we went, and it was work. It was wild, it was wild. And that's just a glimpse into the stuff that's coming, guys. We're, we're going to bombard you in October with a bunch of Ghost Hunters episodes, brand new ones, so some crazy stuff. <laughs> crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, um, guys, what would you say is the biggest, just give one, your biggest misconception people have about paranormal investigation? Because there are a lot of shows on TV and we do things very differently. And I think that's because there are a lot of misconceptions people have about the field. So whoever's got one, Darren, you wanna start? I Amen. believe uh, people who sit at home and have never done it before think it's easy when it's not. Especially what we do, being on the road so much away from our families, traveling from airplane to airplane, to car to car, and to location to location. It's a lot of work. I mean, there's literally 99% of it is work and maybe 1% of it is just, you know, having fun. You know, another one is that we only investigate in the dark. You know, that's completely not the case. And you know, when we do investigate at night, it's because we're cutting down on contamination. You know, during the day, there's a lot of traffic, a lot of people coming in and out of these buildings. So we want to cut down on that contamination as much as possible. But more than like what 75% of our investigations take place during the day with the research and talking to eyewitnesses and really trying to get an idea of you know the building and, and how the phenomena is taking place. So we're not always in the dark. I would say like everything's a demon. Like you know most most the most instances it's just kind of like you know a normal everyday person like a slob like me and Brandon like you know what I mean? just whatever it was Brandon's like speak for yourself but like it's, I think it's just you know in most cases just regular everyday people you gotta think it's the entities aren't always bad I mean think about the thousands of people you've come across in your life how many of them have tried to physically harm you like from the guy who sold you your coffee to you know your school principal you know well maybe if you had a bad or principal. to a room full of people staring at you on a stage <laughs> yeah exactly I think that a lot of people think that we're just a bunch of weirdos that, you know, worship the devil and all this other stuff, but like... Whoa! No, like, at least where I'm from, like, when you say you are a paranormal investigator, they're like, okay, like, mm, 
maybe we don't want to invite you to the picnic. Like, you're a little weird. I'm like, maybe you got someone in your house. I'm just saying, I saw them. <laughs> They're not alive, by the way. I would say that not every place is haunted. I mean, it takes a lot of work to go in there, and you could be in there hours and hours and not have that experience. I like to say, maybe it was Kristen. I don't know if I'm gonna use it. It's like fishing, you know what I mean? That was me. Okay, it was Rochelle, whatever. <laughs> Literally, you could be in there hours and hours and not get anything, but that one time that something happens, it sticks with you and that's what keeps you going on. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Rochelle. Banking on what Brian just said, um, yeah, sometimes you don't get anything and I think people expect that you're supposed to right away. And if you think about it, the people who have the most experiences are the ones who live in the home, the, one who's, the ones who are calling you to be there, the ones who own the building. Because just like humans, we feel more comfortable um, talking or showing ourselves to someone we feel more familiar with, right? And I believe it's the same with entities. And so a lot of times during our investigation, we will bring in the homeowner or the building owner because we're hoping that is a familiar face and will create some comfortableness during the investigation uh, that provides us more accessibility to that communication with the entity. So um, I, I think that that is a, a big misconception that we go in there and boom, right away something's gonna happen. Um, I think it's important to try to make a relationship or build a relationship with an entity to have that communication. Yeah, for me, I think it's it's a little combination of all of this. It's just that it's just not what you think. And you know what? I've been doing this for 30 years. To be honest, there are no experts out there. So be careful. Everything you read, see, and hear, including what we say, take with a grain of salt. Hold your own path. I mean, uh, if someone says they're an expert, a paranormal expert, don't trust them. It's just not true. We don't know enough about it. Just people have experience doing it. And I'll tell you what, uh, some of the experiences I've had have leave you with more questions than when you went in. For, for example, let me give you an example. We were on an investigation. Uh, I'm getting up for this. Yeah. Well, what are you doing? No. Are you going to? No, I have to demonstrate. Now? We were on. I'm not going to break dance. Relax. Uh, we were on an investigation in Connecticut. It was myself, another investigator, and a trainee. This will give you an example of just how much we don't know what's going on. Uh, we were investigating and we walked into the doorway of this bedroom and in the doorway uh, in the bedroom There was some space and then a bed with the headboard against the wall and then beyond that bed some space and then the wall And so we walk in the doorway we look and between the bed and the far wall is this shadow Shadow figure our trainee goes nope and runs downstairs <laughs> <laughs> So she was gone Oof. And then the other investigator myself walk in the room. I walked around the bed and I put my arm through it a few times. And it felt a little staticky. I'm like, this is cool. And then the entity ran around us out the room and down the staircase. That's pretty cool, right? Ghost, right? It's a ghost. That's a dead person. We didn't expect to see it there. A few weeks later, we go back. I pay attention. I send this trainee back up to that room so she could face her fears. So she's up there for a little while, and then she comes running down the staircase and tells a very interesting story, pay attention. She said she was in that room trying to get come to grips with it, and she was sitting on the bed, and then she stood up and turned around, and there in the doorway were three shadow figures. One of them ran out, of the, ran out and down the stairs. The other two came in the room, one walked around the bed and passed its arm through her a few times, which freaked her out, so she ran around them and went downstairs. Now, she had no idea what happened in there a few weeks prior. Does this sound familiar? Yeah, I had to tell her, like, that wasn't a ghost. That was me from three weeks ago passing my arm through you. It's a temporal anomaly. Strange stuff like that. So, uh, again, what are we dealing with? We don't really know. But all we know is that dead people is about 90% of what we encounter, and it makes a lot of sense. You interact with them, they react. You can strike deals with them, not like shake the hand of the devil deals, but like you can set up arrangements. So we had an, uh, a case where this uh, couple, the husband was away for six months out of the year, building skyscrapers. 
And when he was gone, there was this male entity in his house that made his wife feel very comfortable. She would open doors for, uh, he would, it would open doors for her, um, let her know when people were approaching the house, things like that. But when he came back, it would slam doors on him, push him off of things. It would make him so uncomfortable to sleep in his bed because this guy was staring at him that he had to sleep on the couch. You know what I mean? Not like he's paying rent. That's messed up. No. <laughs> so the, guy, the guy was a construction worker. He's not burning sage and, and talking about crystals. I mean, he's just, he's a construction worker. So he didn't, he was like, what do I do? I don't want to kick it out because my wife is comfortable when I'm not here. But when I'm here, I can't sleep in my own bed. And so we talked to him and he, he said, this is your house, man. What do you want? How do you want it to work? And so we all sat there together and he explained to this entity, hey, when, when I'm gone, be here. Take care of my wife, all this stuff. But when I come back, you need to go away. Well, that was 25 years ago, 20 something years ago, and it's worked. That's the arrangement they have. But the funny thing is, talk about history. We researched that place and we found that there was a guy in there who uh, was in love with this girl, but she fell for another guy. So he killed her, killed him, and then killed himself. And we found a picture of the woman, and it was a spitting image of this guy's wife. That's what makes us think maybe they're people, you know what I mean? So we treat them like people, we treat them with respect, rather than the monsters that we see in movies, and it works. Crazy, right? What the heck is a ghost? So uh, we've been babbling for quite a while now. Guys, we have a couple microphones here, I think, or we have a microphone here. If you have questions, please come ask. We'd love to answer them. Just keep in mind there may be kids in the room, so keep them appropriate, okay? Yeah, Rochelle. Yeah, Rochelle. <laughs> I have kids and I talk like this at home, so maybe I'm a bad mom, I don't know. All right, hit us. We're ready. All right. Here's a great, important question when you throw something. Everybody always claims that batteries are getting drained on a constant basis when doing investigations. Has anybody really analyzed what type of batteries are getting drained more than others? Lithium ion, alkaline, hybrid, you know, is, has anybody figured out a statistical analysis of why that might be? And one other question. Since ghosts can sometimes see us, or whatever these entities are, and they can make noises and knocks, has anybody ever thought about putting up a giant Morse code-like chart so that they can actually spell out words that way? We have, we have worked with Morse code, and it has worked. Um, not only in knocking, but through devices. Um, but to answer the battery question, um, I've noticed that lithium ion, uh, they have a harder time with. But it's not just a battery. It's not like you can put batteries here on the floor. The battery has to be in the device and the device has to be on. And what happens is it's not that it just drains the potential energy from the battery. It's like it's drawing from it at the same time. So there has to be like a completed circuit for electricity. The battery has to be already emitting that energy. It, it, this is a uh, theory. It's all based on our, our trends and our observations. But so for example, you have an old camcorder, right? And it'll say 120 minutes of battery life. Then all of a sudden it'll go down to 20 minutes, and then it'll go back to 45. So that shows a power draw. Draw it. It couldn't. Pa it was trying to power that device and something else, and that's why it went down to 20 minutes. Then it stops powering to something else, and all it's got is 45 minutes of battery left. That was a great question, though. That would be a really interesting study is to go through the different types of batteries that you mentioned. But like Grant said, the lithium ion seems to be different. There's something why that is. I'm not sure, but amazing question. That would be a really cool case study, actually. Thank you for that question. Yeah. Please. My name is Sue. Hi, Sue. Hi, Sue. I, um, I have a two-part question. First of all, um, I can t I understand that when you see shadows or the rocks get thrown at you or that, I mean, you're obviously are in, in touch with an entity. But how do you know that an orb or something like that is really um, something paranormal? But yes. And the second part of the question is um, the machines that you use that are some somehow um, indicative of uh, a spirit or something or paranormal uh, uh, being there. How do you know that those are really accurate? How, I mean, I'd like to know more about the machines. Just because the machine says it's there, how do we know the machine was not made to do something else? You know? That's a very great good question. question. 
Yeah, no. So obviously we have to go with what we, you know, with us on Ghost Hunters, we don't use devices specifically made for paranormal research. We try and stay away from that stuff because a lot of times they say entertainment use only on the bottom of them, so I'm just saying. But uh, we want to use what's available, you know, technology-wise. So we're going to try and get read all the environmental conditions. So if there is an event, we want to be using technology that's built for other industries. So our data logger, for instance, has sensors in that that read humidity, pressure, temperature, and EMF. And we know that those are the environmental conditions you typically associated with phenomena, <coughs> but we wanna be using those sensors that are built for those purposes of those environmental readings, not for the paranormal investigation purpose. Just yeah. to put it into perspective real quick, in this last case that we went on, so we got uh, what we believe was a, a shadow figure on a FLIR camera, and the heat signature of the shadow figure was way, like it was way cooler than everything else. What's cool about that is now that we have our data logger that can measure the temperature, after that shadow figure leaves and we believe passed by us, all of a sudden the temperature has a huge drop and there's a pressure change at the same time as we're getting that. So then if you have multiple devices validating the same experience, that's when you know like, oh, I got the money now, baby. <laughs> yeah, we want, we want devices that will collect the data for us that we can then interpret if there's something paranormal rather than something that goes ding, ghost. And again, it's, it's all theory, <laughs> it's all theory, you know? So we're just trying to work with what we have and what's readily available to us and just trying to build off of those theories and understanding what's the data associated with it and what common trends and patterns are we starting to notice to say, hey, look, we have something that we can't explain at this moment. So we're, we're doing the best work we can, but I think that we're making some really great strides. And if you think about it, if you're using, gadgets and uh, instruments that are used to try to investigate the supernatural and find ghosts, that equipment is already being made with a bias in it, and we want to try to stay clear of that. Now to speak to orbs, orbs is something that's been the bane of our existence for a long time. It, orbs to me are always either, I mean they, they can be created by dust, bugs, moisture, light, um, you know, lens flares and refraction. And we are honestly looking for bigger fish. I don't want to trust a picture of this circle that can be caused by something that's literally everywhere. Right. Now, if you get a picture and you felt like dead Uncle Fred was standing next to you in that picture and there's an orb in it, I don't think there's any harm in believing that he was there with you. But what you want to, you have to understand that this can be created by stuff that's literally everywhere. Now, if you see what looks like a glowing ping pong ball, or, or uh, uh, maybe the size of a marble with your own eyes, that could be something called plasma lights, which is a natural phenomenon. And it's not indicative of anything paranormal, but it's indicative that there, it does say that there's more energy in the air than an entity could draw from potentially. So if you take a picture of that, you're basically taking a picture of a gas station, hoping you'll find a car. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, thank you. I have to ask one for my daughter. Is it all real? So everything you see us do on TV is very, very real. Yeah, I'm right falling through stairs. Thank you. The thing is, I, yeah, thank you. No, that's a great question, really? though, because we, when you, as a paranormal investigator, the only thing you have is your credibility. You don't have a degree. You don't have any of that. And I've spent 30 years building mine, and I'm not going to throw it away for money or TV, TV show rating. Oh, oh, wait. You got that. Man. Right? Oh, okay. 14 years I've been doing this. And I've, I've been lucky enough to work with uh, a man named Dr. Harry Clore. He's the only person in history to receive two PhDs simultaneously in any discipline, and he received that in physics and chemistry. I've been, Easy. Yeah. I've been working with him for 10 years, and I've been very lucky to have such people that have helped me remain grounded and trying to stick to scientific principle as much as possible. So no way I would throw any of that away for a, t a television show. No way. Honestly, if it was fake, it'd probably look cooler. Anyway, go ahead. No, so, thanks. No, that's, that's great. My name's Alex. I have a two-part question. It's actually for the audience as well. Do you know of any organizations or like meetup groups where you could actually do this on the weekend if you have like local haunted areas? And why can't we do that? That's number one. Number two, because I don't know how, how long you guys are in the area for. There's allegedly some haunted bars all off of Main Street. I live down here. I walk here from my apartment this morning. Um, one of them is called Frankie's. A buddy of mine in the back, me and him play pool there pretty much every week. And the balls up on the table have moved strangely and things like that. And we've met bartenders who have said some stuff. If you guys have someone I could talk to, I could tell you the address and everything. But those are my questions. 
we'll so, be there tonight. Yeah, are you yeah. are you buying? <laughs> are you buying? <laughs> <laughs> I want a happy hour. So, hey, right? guys, I want to let you know. Brian's already breaking stuff up here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> can't take this guy anywhere, man. You see what I have to deal with? Lucky's well, a nice guy. So as far as that, uh, like, if you want to try this, uh, get online. There are a lot of places, a lot of groups and, and companies out there that run events. Yeah. That you can go. So you can go and investigate places like Pennhurst Asylum or... Eastern State Penitentiary or whatever, these places. Um, and so you go in with a bunch of other people and you can get a feel for it. Now there are also a lot of groups in your area, if you just put in your city and paranormal investigation team, or you go to the TAPS Family website, those, it's TAPS Family, um, just type that in and you go to the website and it's a list of respectable groups around the world that, um, that can come and help if you think you have a problem in your home. That's where I would go first. Okay. If you just wanna do it for kicks, uh, look at, I would look for one of these events. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Thanks man. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Yeah, man. Hi, my name's Avery, and um, to Mustafa real quick, I get the whole history nerd thing. I was just accepted into a college three days ago to get my bachelor's in history. Wow, so, so, I get awesome. the history thing, but wow. my question is, do any of you guys believe that there could be an entity or a phenomenon strong enough to enter somebody's dreams? Yeah, so that's a good question. Dreams is a huge oh, yeah. area. Like we know this, right? But there are people that I've interacted with that they'll dream and then they'll have dreams that are very different, much more vivid, much more lucid. You know, they can control what's happening. And they'll have these dreams, they'll remember them, and then the next day or so, that they'll, they'll see that happen. So when it comes to dreams, only you know it well enough. The other thing is, think about it. Um, you have to take it all with a grain of salt. Really, really big grain of salt. But um, if you think about it, theoretically, you're in the most relaxed state you'll ever be in, right? So a lot of people spend time meditating, trying to reach this state while they're awake. And during those meditation times is where people get the, this information or contact or insight from other people. So if you're having a dream and some loved one comes to you or someone you don't like comes to you in a dream, um, just don't be afraid. Like pay attention because it's probably something from your subconscious speaking out to you. So listen to it, but try to separate that person from it. So if you have a dream and I come to you and smack you in the face, like don't blame me for that, that was your subconscious. Okay, everyone hear that? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, all right. Just so you know, basically dreams, right? our dreams are our subconscious mind speaking to us. It's just in a different language. And I work a lot with my clients with dream therapy because it actually helps me to understand really what they're feeling from their dreams. Now we are on a different level of consciousness. Can someone reach out during that different level of consciousness? I've had a lot of times where I've taken people in meditative states and a family member has come to them and they were healed because of it. Um, their emotional stability came back. And I'm not gonna say that that person wasn't visited by that loved one. Perhaps they were, perhaps because in that state it made them more accessible. And that's really you know, what I'm doing here and what we're all doing here is that's what we're researching. You know, how much of that is manifested from the mind and how much of that is actually coming from this other world or this other place. It's almost like you know what you're talking about, Kristen. I hope so. I hope so. What do you got? Hey, guys. I'm Andrew. Uh, first off, uh, great job on this. You guys are really entertaining and informative. Thank you. Uh, Thanks. I have a two-part question. Uh, first off, um, the, um, it's been said that you know uh, malevolent entities can attach themselves to people, and uh, I wonder if that's anything that you guys worry about or have encountered. Uh, secondly, uh, it, has this has Y'all's experiences changed uh, anyone's religious beliefs influence it. So when it comes to, if I can speak to this, when it comes to negative entities, um, there, there's something out there, there's something real. Um, my wife and I deal with this predominantly because a lot of people don't know how to handle it, so it comes to us so for some reason. My wife is here, by the way, she's standing right there. Hi, Ria. Oh, sitting Hi, Ria. Hey. Um, but we're dealing with about about 12, 11 or 12 cases right now. And so it's whether it's demons or whatever, it's very real. There are people that deal with this stuff. And it's not like you're going to be walking down the street whistling a happy tune 
and a demon jumps out of a dumpster and now you got a demon <laughs> and you're screwed. Like it's not, Mustafa. I'll jump out of a dumpster. <laughs> you might have a Mustafa, but you won't have a demon. Um, it's, it, uh, this is a long discussion, but I'll, I'll trim it. Um, basically, um, they, it's like a lion chasing a gazelle, a gazelle to go after the, the weak and the sick, right? So people who are easily obsessed or have addictions or are doing something very jail worthy, um, them and their immediate circle of friends will start to be affected by this. Um, and it's very real. And what you see on, this is one of my soapbox moments, what you see on a lot of shows on TV is a lot of misinformation. This stuff is real, but it's not this Halloween bull crap you see on TV. Mm. And it, it bothers me because these people are saying that this is a demon or this is negative and they're acting like they have cancer when they don't, when there are really people out there who have this cancer, so to speak, and you're taking attention and resources away from them. So it's very, very real. Yeah, very detrimental, which you see a lot out there, a lot of misinformation and misconception. And when people are out there doing that for entertainment purpose like that, it's extremely detrimental. Like Grant said, it's a perfect analogy. There's people out there that have this sickness, it's like a cancer, if you will. Then you have these other people out there for their own benefit, just trying to get viewers and ratings, you know, you know, basically. Uh, anyway, so. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, religious changes, that, that's a long stuff. Maybe we'll move on to the next one. Is that okay? Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'll, I'll, uh, I might be able to talk to you later about that. Cause Hi. I have a... Hey, man, what's up? Hi. Hello, man. Um, I have a question. Go for it. Is there a place that you want to um, investigate but you aren't able to yet? Rattle it off. Go. Daryl, you got one? Way out. Way out. Anywhere in Ireland. Just take me to Ireland, please. <laughs> I Iraq. Country. Iraq. Jeez, heavy, yeah, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Mine's the White House, too. Potawatomi Jail in Iowa. Uh, Tower of London. Any of the Disney parks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, bud. <laughs> Hi, my name is Riley, and I have a question. Um, what's the what's the best piece of evidence, visual evidence that you guys have caught? Best piece of visual evidence? Good question. That we caught together or any of us have ever experienced? Well, I, I caught a piece of evidence in uh, the, on the Queen Mary in 2008 in the first glass pools changing stalls. And that's an area that's widely known for a little girl haunting that place named Jackie. And in 2008, I was with an investigator in training and a security guard when I was teaching this investigator how to conduct an EMF sweep when we captured an image that's pretty unbelievable. And I've had it tested by many professionals, I've had it looked at by a lot of people, and no one can explain that. So if you go to YouTube and type in Queen Mary Apparition, A-P-R-A, -A, Apra, you can see that. I'm there. Hang on. <laughs> I'll say, first of all, I love your hair. My hair yeah. was that color, and it, mine, wig. mine wasn't a wig, but I, I'm going back to it, but I love it. Um, Brian and I were investigating at Malvern Manor, and we actually caught a ball move on camera, and we tried to debunk it and could not figure out how to do it. It was pretty awesome. I had one case we were doing, this guy, he had just built this new house in the middle of the woods, and he was complaining that his pots and pans would stack. Okay, cool, so we go there now, this will tell my age, we had the big video camera with the VHS tape, and we had one. Um, so we went and we put the camera in the kitchen, went downstairs, he wanted to show us this cool room downstairs, and we came back up, and the pots and pans weren't stacked, but all the furniture in the living room was rearranged. The couch was standing up on its side, all this stuff. So we're like, okay, let's move our big stupid camera to the next room, to the living room. We put it all back, went downstairs, came back up, and all the pots and pans were stacked. <laughs> okay, now he's messing with us. So the homeowner said I had a big stupid camera too, so we set one up in each room. Stop calling that. <laughs> they're feeling the big stupid cameras. Glad they're gone. So we went downstairs, came back up, and the pots and pans were stacked. And we looked at our camera, and it was still recording. This is good. So we reviewed the tape, and what we see is, you're looking out over the table and the sink and stuff and all the cupboards, 
and this is back in VHS, so you're watching it, and all of a sudden that tracking, you know, it starts to get grainy and all that, but you can still see, and all of a sudden, in a matter of less than three seconds, these black shadows and all the pots and pans stack like that, not a sound. That's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. I think mine happened at my house. So I basically went on an investigation, came home. Uh, me and my wife were watching RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> Huge fan. Anyways, uh, to, to get to our kitchen, you have to go past our living room. And my kids were in bed. They were at a different part of the house. And we had been watching this show for hours. And my wife walked into the kitchen and she says, come here. So I did. And every one of my cabinets were open in my house. And she said, not doing this, Brian. So I said, well, I think this is awesome. <laughs> so I left them open. She's like, well, shut them. No, I'm gonna leave them open. I'm gonna ask them to shut it, you know? So I went back to Drag Race. And uh, about an hour later, she went back in there and every one of them were shut. That was cool. <laughs> Good. We, got, we, got, we can do one more question, unless you guys really have some. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We are so over our time, but we're going to go rebel. One more question. Hi, guys. Hi, how are you? Hello. I'm doing great. Um, my name's Becca, and from what I understand, a lot of paranormal uh, is just energy, just lots of energy. So what are your opinions and or experiences with poltergeists? Okay, so just for semantics here, a poltergeist for me by definition is not a, when you get sucked into a TV or a tree eats you or a clown attacks you. It's not. <laughs> He's like, it's not. Um, no, a poltergeist is when it's any paranormal activity that's probably caused by someone who is still alive. And now energy is interesting. We have a lot of misconceptions about energy. We think of energy as a thing, and it's not a thing. It's an adjective. It's a quality an object has. Okay, so we say, oh, it's, there's, I can feel your energy. And that, that doesn't work that way. There's potential chemical and nuclear energy, you know? Um, so what's fascinating is there's a specific type of poltergeist that seems to affect kids going through those changes and later, women going through those wonderful changes. Um, menopause. And, um, okay. Say like we don't have enough problems yeah. at that point. All the guys are like, yeah, it's very paranormal. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but there is something that happens when, when girls specifically are going through this, they seem to be able to manifest paranormal activity as filtered through their psyche. This is a long, long story, we'll trim it down. Um, and this is something we've seen several times. We, we, you saw an episode of Ghost Hunters where this happened with this woman, Deanna. But what you didn't see is what we did. We didn't just bring her in the house and leave. We brought her in the house and then I had her tell me experiences and I didn't, acted like I didn't believe her, so I was stressing her out, agitating her. And the activity increased the more agitated she got. Then we brought her husband in and he was brave enough to agitate her too, and it went up even further. So she had had a life, uh, she didn't have the best relationships in her life, let's put it that way. And so all the activity, as she was telling us, was filtered through that. So any entity that was, any time the experience she was probably creating was negative, it was manifesting as a man. When it was positive, it was manifesting as a girl. And uh, this is a very strange phenomenon. Guys, I don't know how it works, I don't know why it happens, but Good on you, ladies. Girl power. Go do it. But um, uh, poltergeists, to me, are very interesting. Now, we worked with uh, Duke University, Ryan Research Center, and they, we had a, a client, and they, they measured her brain waves, and stuff was moving in her house, and she was going through menopause. And she, uh, no, I'm not, I'm staying on the stage. And, and she, uh, she said, she was afraid of her house, you know, all these objects moving. And we found that right before anything would move, there would be a spike in brain activity. So something was happening in her brain, and then an object would move. Uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question or not, but it's. No, yeah, but 
It's fascinating. I mean, we've dealt with it many, many times. I could tell you stories all day, but it's, we don't have it's time It's almost as if the that. subconscious mind is manifesting itself because the person themselves feels repressed and they can't speak their truth. So it's almost as if the subconscious mind takes over and says, uh, I'm going to handle this myself. Because oftentimes we'll raise awareness to something that may be going wrong. And it's fascinating a subject to study. I'm fascinated with it because it all um, comes from the subconscious mind. It's almost like uncontrolled uh, telekinesis, or uh, and, and the person which we would call the agent doesn't know that they're doing it. They think they're having a paranormal experience, but it's actually being manifested from their issues. And science is super interested in this, but they look at it more from the teens because we're trying to understand why teens are the way they are. So if you want to look more into it, yeah, look at like teenage telekinesis or teenage angst, paranormal. You can look this stuff up and they're really trying to get to the bottom of it. All right, guys, I think that's all the time we have. Thank you very much. I want to thank you all for your support. Weirdos, everyone. Stay weird, guys. Stay weird. Thank you guys so much.